Hello, everybody. It's another episode of the what's now the IoT show. It used to be called Things on Thursdays. Uh, we're actually back on Thursday, but as I'm not really able to keep to a regular time slot at the moment, I'm going with calling it the IoT show, and that will do for now. So it's been a moment, so bear with me if things are a little bit scrappy today. Um, I've not been pressing the buttons on StreamYard or doing this much for a while recently, but um, we're going to have a go at showing something today that involves a Raspberry Pi and a camera and putting a different type of data into Redis. So a lot of the time on this stream and other content that you see from the developer relations team, we are working with basically strings or JSON data. Um, and yeah, we're putting those into different data types, like we might be using a stream, or we might be using a hash, or we might be using the JSON data type. Um, but at the end of the day, all the data is, is basically strings. Um, it's usually like UTF encoded text. Um, what we're going to look at today, which is something that a community member sort of asked me about, and I'd wanted to do for a while, and I was like, okay, I'll do a, a live stream about it is how we can store um, image data, well, binary data, but specifically image data. So I thought, what can we do with this? Um, I've got some Raspberry Pi stuff. I happen to have a Raspberry Pi camera. Um, it was actually sat in my box of things that haven't been used for a long time and should probably get resold on eBay if I ever get the time. Um, and luckily it had not gone out of the door yet. So. Um, I have a camera and I've ended up actually buying another one having got interested in this and we'll look at the differences in those in a moment. So what we're gonna try and do now is um, look at setting up some, um, some image capture with Redis. We wanna capture the images, store them in Redis and we're gonna use the Raspberry Pi for that. And then we obviously wanna be able to see what we've captured so we could do something later with it. I'm not gonna do any like interesting processing on the images. We'll keep this one kind of simple, uh, just store and retrieve the images. And um, looks like uh, Kevin's along. Hi, Kevin. Um, you can find Kevin at kevsrobots.com. It's actually Kevin who was asking about this topic. So um, here we go, we, we get to do it. Um, so yeah, what we're gonna do is look at the hardware we've got, look at what we're doing with Redis. I'm going to code it in Python, or I have coded it in Python because it's kind of native to the Raspberry Pi. But I also coded the server component, so I made a web front end also in Python, but that was kind of an arbitrary choice, really. It could have been anything. Um, so yeah, let's see what we're, uh, what we're looking at. And uh, bear with me while I change a few things around and remember how the buttons work. Here we go. So um, I've got a Raspberry Pi 3 Model B sitting on the unit behind me somewhere. Um, we can have a look at that later. There's a separate camera on it. And it doesn't need to be this particular one. It needs to be anything with the camera connector on it. So the camera has like a ribbon connector. It plugs into a specific connection on the Pi. It's not like USB or anything. And um, that's how you you connect it. So basically any Pi that's got that, it could be a four, it could be a three model A, it could be a two. Um, I think the original one is probably still good, but you're gonna need like Wi-Fi adapters because we're, we're using the network unless you've got hardwired ethernet. So looking at this thing close up, you can see uh, the camera adapters kind of down the bottom here and it's got this plastic thing. You pull it out or pull it loose, push the uh, ribbon connector in and then back in again. So if you've ever built like a PC or anything, it's kind of a bit like building stuff inside a desktop PC, attaches like that. The camera itself um, doesn't come with a housing or anything. It's got some holes in it, so you can mount it on stuff. Um, we'll see how I mounted it later. I did a really low tech, um, really low cost mount that basically doesn't involve anything. And what you see here is it's got this ribbon cable and it's um, it's got the mount and you shove the ribbon cable in in one end. And this is an old version of the camera. So this is the version two. Um, it came out, as it says, April 2016. That was quite a while ago. And I've had one of these on the shelf for a very, very long time. And I don't think I'd ever used it or taken it out of the box. Um, not because there's anything wrong with it, just because I'd never, I thought, yeah, I'd get into camera stuff and, and never had a need. If you were starting this today, you would probably get the camera module three, or if you've got a bit more of a budget, there's a really high definition one. Um, 
and we'll talk about um, how like quality of images fits with Redis later because there's some trade-offs there. And what I've got is I've got the camera model two that I'm going to demo with today. I've got a camera model three. So if we just uh, quickly remove that, make me big again. Here's a model three camera, and there you can see it's uh, it's ribbon cable that plugs in. The big difference with this one is it's a bit higher resolution, which is, you know, all right, that's decent, um, always worth having. But the big advantage is it's got an autofocus mode in it. So the one we're demonstrating with today doesn't have autofocus, which means some of our images might be a bit out of focus. It's not a feature of Redis or the code we're using to capture the image or even the camera. It's just a limitation of the hardware. So I'm using the old one without autofocus. I'll probably keep running with this project and do another show about it, and we'll add autofocus and some more Redis features or something so we can see how that works. So you hear us talk a lot about data types in Redis. So Redis has a bunch of built-in data types. And the basic one that most people use for caching and just storing text is a string. So you just put some string value in there. Um, traditionally, you might have put serialized JSON in there. We now have a JSON data type that would allow you to do more interesting operations on it than just store it. But the strings have always been kind of like better than just a string. So they're really, as it says here in the in the uh, Redis IO site, they are um, sequences of bytes. So people serialize, for example, Java objects into them, um, binary data, which is, you know, we're going to look at that today with the images. So whilst they are the most basic Redis data type, they're pretty versatile. So we can put a whole image in a single string or anything that expects a string. So that includes some other data types. So what we're going to use today is actually a hash. So a hash kind of looks like a flat map of name values. So it's like storing a flat object, and it all lives in a Redis key. And why do we want to use a hash when we're storing an image? Well, there's like metadata that we might want to add about the image, and we might want to use that later to do searching or retrieval or filtering or whatever. So we're going to add some basic metadata about the image. And then if I take this forward in a future show, what we'll do is add some more data and then we'll sort of update the front end so we can do like a faceted search or something and find images between a given time period or images that have a certain amount of lux to them or whatever else we can get from the camera. So we're going to do those things. Um, I said I'd sort of show the... Uh, the hardware we've got here. So um, over there on the bench behind me is the Raspberry Pi 3. It's actually in a, a case that's from Adafruit, um, but any old case will do. I like this case because the lid has got some holes cut out for the ribbon cables for the camera. So you don't have to like um, escape them out of the case in a way that they're going to get crushed. There's an actual hole for it. So that came out and you probably can't see it. I should have used a different color, but I went with the super... Um, super cheap and convenient method of just that's black electrical tape around the uh the ribbon cable there so the camera is just literally taped to the raspberry pi so it kind of looks like some sort of miniature speeding camera or something and then over there next to it we've got a dymo cum plush toy just as our model for today um and we'll prove that we're taking live photos later by putting some other things in there with him but uh, that's our camera set up so we said we'd uh we revisit that and so we've got all of this stuff which is not very much stuff actually which got raspberry pi it's got an operating system on it it's connected to the network um it's got a couple of configuration things in the raspberry config for the camera you have to turn the interface on and tweak a couple of other things um, i've documented those in the github we won't go into setting up the hardware in this case um, and then for software, I decided to go with Python all the way across the whole application. So we need to talk to Python or we need to talk to Redis from Python. And for that, we need what's called a Redis client or an SDK or a driver. Um, in the Redis world, they're called clients with other databases. You might have heard them called SDKs or drivers. Same thing, really. So what we're doing here is we're using one called Redis Pi, which is pretty popular. Um, and we're going to use a couple of features of it. 
we're going to use the ability to call Redis commands, and we're going to use the ability to handle binary data. We then also want to show what we've received. So I thought, why not do that with a web application? It's kind of the obvious way to do something when you've got data in a database. So this won't be a tutorial on the Flask framework, but Flask is a really good framework for building web applications or APIs or whatever you want to build in Python. Um, it's pretty well documented. It's easy to get up and running with. So we'll have a small Flask application that for the purposes of today is just going to show the images and make them look nice on a web page. I'm not a front end developer. So making them look nice is basically I outsource that job to usually the Bulma framework, which is a very easy to use HTML, CSS, whatever you want to call it, lightweight, front weight, front end framework that doesn't need you to learn all of the stuff that you might need to do to use, say, a view or a React. And it doesn't need a compile time step and all that stuff. Um, so we're going to put images in what look like roughly this card component. So if you're familiar with um, certain popular social media sites, you know, people might post short updates and they might have a view like this or their profile might look like this. Um, and Bulma provides this out of the box. And basically, we just use some pretty simple HTML tags and use their classes on them. So they've done all the CSS for us, uh, which is great because you don't want me doing your front end. So given that, what we're going to try and end up at is something that looks like this. So we've already gone ahead and built this. It exists. It's in GitHub. And you can uh, use the the link down the bottom to get there. I'll put it in the video description afterwards if it isn't already there. But um, what you'll get when you're running the application is just this simple view of all of the images. It is really, really simple. I haven't thought about anything like scale. What if there's thousands of images and maybe I should lazy load them? Or what if um, I want to do some filtering on those images? That will be a topic for another day. So today's just about getting the data into Redis, pulling it out again, and making sure that we didn't corrupt it. So, you know, a good image goes in, good image comes out, it renders in the browser. That's what we want to see today. So with that said, I'm going to start looking at the source code a little bit, and then we'll have a quick demo of this. And then that's pretty much the scope of today's stream. So let's switch over to trusty VS Code here. I uh, organized this into a couple of components. So there's a Pi component, which is going to be the uh, the image capturing code that runs on the Raspberry Pi, and the server component that can kind of run anywhere. So I'm going to run it on, on the local Mac here. It could run on the Raspberry Pi as well if you wanted to put the, the server on there and have everything on there for some reason. Um, the only thing that they both need to have in common is the same Redis instance. So the camera on the Pi is going to write into Redis. The server is going to read out of Redis. They both need to be looking at the same instance of Redis to, to be able to do that. So we'll begin with the, let's begin with capturing some pictures. So I've got a very simple capture script here. We're not going to do anything clever. Again, in a future stream, we might do something like add an arcade button for you know press and it takes a picture or add a motion sensor and whenever there's motion it takes a picture so you might build like a wildlife detector out of that or something um i've gone for the bare minimum demo of we are basically going to sit in a while loop and take a picture and let's move this a little bit bigger for everyone and at the end of our while loop we are just going to go to sleep for 10 seconds so we're going to take a picture every 10 seconds, and that's all we're going to do. But from this, we could obviously change this around, put the picture taking stuff in a function, and call that function like on an event. So if a button's pressed, or if a noise is detected, if we've got a microphone type sensor plugged in, or whatever else, motion sensor, if we've got a PIR. So we could do something like that. Um, what? Let's have a look at how this code works. So. There's a really good um, library for the Pi camera called Pi Camera 2. I'm just going to bring up its data sheet. 
you can obviously use USB cameras or other things with the Raspberry Pi, but the great thing about their own products is they are just so well documented. So this Pi Camera 2 library has, yeah, it's completely documented and they cover advanced cases like let's just get on with using TensorFlow or FFmpeg and we can capture videos. I just wanted the really simple case of capturing images down here. Um, and they cover that really, really nicely. So I read that and was able to learn about it. And it, you know, it's very well documented. It works great. There are some subtle differences between the camera version two that I've got and the camera version three with the autofocus. And we'll come to those if we go with version three in a future stream. But for now, basically, all I need to do is create a Pi Camera 2 instance and then not entirely sure if I really needed this or not, but start preview, I think kind of turns the camera on a bit and maybe with an autofocus one, we'll get it to focus on something. And this is designed for like desktop operation too. So we could pass in something that represents a preview window if we had like a GUI application and we wanted to look through the camera. We're headless, we're running on a Raspberry Pi that's behind me, so don't need one of those. Um, we can then also go with a configuration object, configure aspects of the camera. So you can configure the image resolution and I guess for the autofocus one, whether or not the autofocus behavior is turned on and a whole load of other things. I just went lazy and went with the standard configuration. So that's gonna use basically the maximum resolution that this camera supports. And we'll see what that means later. And then we just tell the camera object, use the configuration. So, so now we've got like a camera object we can use for stuff. Um, we want to store everything in Redis. So I'm using Redis Pi and we have to initiate initialize that. And there's a few ways you can do it. You can pass in like a host name, a port, username and a password for where Redis lives. Um, or you can use what is known as a Redis URL format. So I like this one because it keeps all of your secrets in one environment variable or one place. You don't have to like store multiple things and have lots of constants in your code. So an example of a Redis URL would be this. So we've got localhost, um, that will be Redis running on the Pi 6379. That's the port that you connect to it to. And if we had a user and a password, we'd just do something like, uh, I think it's something like, sorry, not there. So user colon password at host and port. So I don't have that. I just um, left that as a, as a default example. So if we don't have some environment variable set, it's going to connect to Redis locally. Um, I've actually set this to be another machine because um, we are storing images. Images take up memory things in redis need to live in memory so if we're going to store images that are like two meg each then we need something with enough memory to be able to receive those images over the period of time that we want to retain them there's a couple of ways we could do that we could have a management strategy that says let's expire the images every now and then we could have a workflow that gets rid of them we could use lower resolution images whatever um so I'm actually using a machine that's got a lot more RAM than the little Raspberry Pi 3, which is like a gigabyte before the operating system starts running. Um, I'm actually using an iMac that's off camera. It's got like 128 gig of RAM, so we're never gonna run out. Um, but in a production system, you wanna think about that as to how long you're keeping the data, how big it is, whether you need to use a cluster or something to um, spread your Redis out across multiple machines so that you can get bigger uh, servers. Or, you know, go ahead and, um, and sign up and use Redis Enterprise. Um, but that's not the, uh, the point of today's stream, so we won't go there today. So once I've got my Redis connection established, then I can start the camera up properly. Um, again, I'm not really sure what Start Preview does versus Start because I'm running headless. I don't have a, a visible preview to, to see when that starts. And then I've just got this loop. And what I want to do is capture an image and I want to store it in Redis. So the normal way that we capture an image and actually the method on the camera object we're going to use is to capture a file. So we would want to capture a file. 
And usually we dump it to the file system. So we'd store it as like whatever image name.jpg or .png or whatever we want to um we want to use. I think the library supports JPEG and PNGs. I'm not oh and raw. Uh I'm not sure about GIF format, but I went with JPEGs. So normally we'd want to store that in a file so I could pass in a file name. As I'm not using the file system as the sort of system of record for these images, I want to put them straight in Redis. So I want to capture that image file, keep it in some in-memory structure, and then put that in memory structure in Redis. So I'm using a Python bytes IO stream array, whatever you want to call it, which looks like a file as far as library code is concerned, but lives in memory. So whenever I capture the image, I'm going to store it in this bytes IO uh, image data structure. And then I am going to also remember when I took that image. So I'm going to take the timestamp of that from the op ultimately the operating system. And the reason why I want to do that is Redis is a key value store. So we store everything against the key. And keys kind of need to have unique names. So having a timestamp as part of my key name helps me out because I can be like, well, this is the image that was taken at this timestamp. And no other image that we ever take will ever have that name again. So we won't overwrite an older image or an existing image or something else in the database. And it's a good idea to give your keys sort of meaningful names and also use what we call a namespacing strategy. So here I'm using image as a sort of static part of my key. And then I'm using colon as a, oops, let's not get rid of that. I'm using colon as a separator and then the current timestamp. So my total key name will be image colon, whatever the Unix timestamp is at the point we took the picture. And I'm then saving, or I'm creating a dictionary to store the things that I wanna save. So I remember I said we wanted to use a Redis hash. So it's like a flat map of, name value pairs. So inside this key image current timestamp, we get like a, a miniature Redis, if you like, we get a miniature name value, key value store. So we can store multiple things about the image in there whilst referring to it by this singular key. So I want to store the actual image data. I'm going to give that a field name of image data. And all I do for that is image data, which is the bytes IO object dot get value. So that just gets me the raw bytes. Um, so again, each value here in this hash is a Redis string. Redis strings are binary safe. So this is okay. We can put binary data in there. Redis isn't going to interpret it anyhow at all, which means when we come to get it out again, we have to know it's binary data and we have to know it's a JPEG image. And that's kind of on our application. So one of the other things I wanted to save in here was this is essentially a constant, but we might write an application that uses different format images for some reason, or we might have applications that have multiple cameras that are creating images in different formats. So I wanted to save a field called mine type so that I can give a hint to whatever application is reading from Redis that whatever you find in image data, you interpret that as a JPEG. And we'll see how that works when we look at the front end. And then the other thing I wanted to put in there was it's part of the key, but it's also going to be useful to have in there for later if we want to do some searching on this is the timestamp that the image was taken at. Um, so we're going to put all of those things into a dictionary. And then we are going to store them in Redis like this. So the way most Redis clients or SDKs work is they expose a, a function per Redis command. So a Redis command is like a, a thing that manipulates the data structure. And usually that command requires a key name to start with. And then it requires some optional arguments. So here in Python, the client has mapped the Redis command to a string key name. And then it can take all sorts of different things. But one of the things it can take is a mapping dictionary. So it's going to store all of those things in Redis. And we can see how that works by sort of doing this command by hand. So over here, we've got Redis Insight, which is the graphical uh, CLI for looking at Redis. I have a database here with some images in it. 
and we will actually get rid of those so that after doing this in production, hopefully you don't have a database access that allows you to do that in production. Um, but I've just wiped the whole database. But that's OK, because it's my database and it's a development one. So what we were going to do was demonstrate the hset command. So here in Python, we've got hset, a key name, and then a dictionary. How the command actually works underneath is, yeah, let's see if we can increase this again a little bit. It's always a fight with how much screen space you've got and the size of your font. So here I can do hset, let's just call it my key, and we'll actually let's do something better. Hset users colon one. So imagine we're storing user information and I'm user one, I'm the first person that gets created. And we can have name Simon and we can have location UK. UK and we can have like email and it's Simon at whatever.com. And what happens is Redis responds with three. So what does that mean? Um, it means we've created a hash here that contains three fields, right? So we got Simon, uh, sorry, name, location, and email. So we've got a hash that contains three fields. People that are used to dealing with relational databases might now be a little bit confused because we didn't declare a schema for this. Uh, there isn't one. So I could do something like this, and I could set users two to have, let's call it somebody else. Let's do some real keyboard like here might have to move to the attached keyboard right so let's change it to my colleague brian who's in the usa brian at whatever.com and let's also add a because brian's in the us we'll add a state so now we've added four things and nothing bad has happened so there's no schema here so what that means is just because I've said the key names users one and then the key names users two, Redis isn't going to enforce any structure inside there. So your application kind of needs to, or it needs to be able to cope with what goes in there. So if we look at these things here in Redis Insight and I refresh the key browser, you'll see I have users one and users two. Click on users one, try and make this a bit wider. And you'll see I have Simon, UK, and email. I have the three things. If you oops, come back to this and click on users two, you'll see Brian has this fourth thing state. And not to labor the point, but if we go back to users one, there is no state field for Simon um, because there's no schema here. So you kind of, you have the freedom to do what you want, which is a benefit. And also means that you need to be a little bit careful so that's hashes. What we'll do is clean this out again and flush the database. So if I then refresh this, and you can turn on auto refresh here as well, you'll see you have a completely empty database. Let's just make this a little bit smaller for the future. So back to our code. So that's H set. We're going to create this hash in Redis and we're going to store these things. So we're going to create a three element hash it's got these names and it'll have these values and one of them will be binary data and going back up here this pycam2.capture file it captures the file into like a if i give it a file name it would dump it to the file system here we've given it essentially a buffer to put it into so it copies the bytes of the file that it captures off of the sensor in the camera into that data structure and then it returns a load of metadata from the camera. And what comes back in there is going to depend on what camera you've got and what it supports. But what I wanted to do was, um, after we've saved the data in Redis, just dump out this metadata and see what was there. Because in future, we might add some more things to it, like information about the light levels or what have you. Or if this thing was in a robot and it moved around and we have a GPS, we might also query the GPS and say, hey, where was this picture taken? 
and then we could do like geo searches on it but um we're going to stick with fairly simple we're just going to output that and then we're going to go to sleep for 10 seconds so that's all the code we need to capture something it's pretty simple we just uh, the trick is we use this bytes.io object rather than a file, and then we do that, and it saves us writing a file to the file system and then reading it and then having to delete a temporary file and all of that stuff. So the obvious thing to do next is give this a bit of a run. So I have got, let's see if it's still alive. Yep, we're logged into the, uh, the Pi 3 in the back there on SSH, and I've got this code there, so we're just going to run it and see what happens. And I am not naturally a very trusting person of Bluetooth peripherals, and the Bluetooth keyboard is going really slowly today. So let's use the laptop one instead. If I run this, what you'll see is it starts up, and it's already started capturing and sending images. So we've stored one at this key in Redis, and here's that metadata that we're not using that comes back from the camera. So we get information about um, the size of the image. Um, what else? We got the lux value. That's to do with light um, and so on. And we might be interested in storing these in the hashes if we wanted to. Just be a case of picking them out of that data structure and adding them into data to save here. So fairly easy. Redis wouldn't care if we started adding more and old images didn't have them because um, it's skinless. So it's off producing images every 10 seconds. And let's bring it onto the screen there. There's nothing to see here. It doesn't pop a flash or anything, but it is capturing images. And how do we know it's capturing images? Because hopefully when I refresh this, we've got all of these uh, new keys. And if I reset the zoom on this and click on, what you'll see is that these keys are quite big in size, or the value there is quite big. We've got a megabyte. So most of that is going to be this image data. And you can see here it's the bytes of um, an image field, or sorry, an image file. And you can see some of the EXIF data, so the headers inside the JPEG format. So it's captured that it was on a Raspberry Pi. It's captured it was 40105. So that stuff's in the image. We also took the timestamp that the operating system thought the picture was taken at. And there's our static mime type that we need for later. So we are building up more and more of these. Um, and some of them are slightly different sizes. I think this is an approximation. So this will be just uh, you know, closer to 2 meg than 1 meg, 1.657, 1.496. So image size varies a little bit. But we are now kind of burning through memory here. So remember, Redis is fast. It's fast because all the data lives in memory, even if you use some of the persistence strategies, that all reads will come from memory. So they're going to be really, really fast. And um, essentially, your writes are going to be really fast because they're into memory. And if you don't want synchronous persistence, then you know, it's going to write to memory very fast and be like, right, on to the next thing. So we are using up a fair amount of memory here. We've used up 22 megs so far. And if we were on higher res images, we'd obviously use up some more. So we might need to think about an image management strategy, but we'll come back to that later. So what I'm going to do now is just turn that off so we're not um, we're not essentially gathering images forever because also nothing's changing on the camera. We've not got anything sensible that says if something moves in front of Daimo Kun down there, take a picture. It's just going to be every 10 seconds. So now we've got some pictures. And we can see um, see the data in Redis. It's not really much use to us in there. Um, I was talking to our product manager about this. And we do support different encodings for fields at the minute or interpreting them as different encodings. And I kind of think it would be cool if we could add images. So I don't know. we'll see if we do that in future. But um, for now. We can see it's in there and it looks like a JPEG image because we kind of know what the bytes of a JPEG header look like. So we're going to say that's OK, but we need some way of visualizing it. So what we need to do is swap to our Flask application. And here in the repository, we have this other folder called server. And I won't sort of 
explain Flask from the beginning, but basically Flask is a way of starting a web server and associating Python functions with routes or routes on that web server. So slash image slash whatever, we can have some code run and that code does whatever it needs to do and it can return different things. So we can return, for example, um, the bytes of an image and we can set the mime type to be what the front end expects and then a browser can render it. So we're gonna have a look at that. So here I've got a few basic constants. We don't really need to worry about those too much. Um, and I'm starting a Flask application, so it's just boilerplate for Flask. In the same way, because we're using Python, we're using the same Redis client that we ran on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, we're running this on the server, which could also run on the Raspberry Pi. We're gonna connect to Redis, same trick of have a look for the environment variable value and fall back to the local machine if not. And then let's just um, close off a few of these for a minute. We've then got some routes in our application. So we want a home page. So when somebody goes to this application's uh, port, because when Flask runs, it's going to attach to a port for us and act like a web server. We want it to do something. Um, so when it goes to slash, I'm telling it render the index template. Um, Flask allows for templating. We don't need anything clever here. We're not passing any values from a database into index.html. What I'm going to do is just serve a static home page and then use JavaScript to call some of these other routes to say, tell me about the images and then I'll, I'll show them. So we can quickly have a look at this. We've got in the templates, we've got index.html. Um, it's an entire HTML document for the front end. All it has is basically an empty container here um, that has this ID of image area. That's where we're going to render the images into when we get them out of Redis. And then it has this sort of fallback notification that says there aren't any images. Um, and that's what we're going to show until the JavaScript in the front end talks to Flask, gets the images, and overrides it with, oh, here's all the images. So. I won't cover how this is structured. It's an HTML document. It uses Bulmer. There's no other CSS trickery. Uh, there is no CSS file for this project, except for the external Bulmer one that I'm using. You don't want to be writing CSS, so I don't even attempt it. Um, so what we've got here is the index. It renders empty. And then what it needs to do is when the page runs, it's going to load some JavaScript. That's going to talk to Flask and say, hey, what images have you got? And get me all of their details. So let's check that out. So back in my Python here, I have a root here that is going to be essentially slash API slash images. So the JavaScript is going to call this. It's going to call this function get all images. and this may not be the cleverest way of doing it, but again, it's a small demo for the purposes of a brief live stream. So we're going to get all of the images, like literally get all of them, every single one. We're not going to worry about pagination or anything like that. And we'll look at how you might handle this at scale uh, in a future live stream. And what we're going to basically do is we are going to say to Redis, um, go get me all of the keys that start with that image colon prefix. So image colon star and where the value stored at those key is a hash. So we're basically saying, get me all of the keys that begin with image and our hashes. And we are going to get back the names of those keys. So we're going to get like an array of the, the names of those keys. And what I was going to do then was just cut out that prefix from them. So I'm taking image colon off the front of the image colon timestamp key name. So if you look in uh, the database here, image colon whatever, why am I doing that? Why am I removing this prefix to go to the front end? A uh, couple of reasons is it's bandwidth that doesn't need to go to the front end. And also it stops a sort of equivalent of a SQL attack. So nobody on the front end in the JavaScript ever sees the full name of the Redis key. So if our prefix wasn't image, it was something like not guessable, or if we had some other prefix in front of it, like my Flask application, colon image, colon timestamp, um, 
we don't essentially write something later where we pass in an image ID and people could pass in arbitrary Redis keys and get other data out of the database. We don't want that. So we're kind of obscuring the schema from the JavaScript front end where anyone can look at it in public, which is not a secure situation. So I'm basically saying to Redis, get me all of those keys. Um, we're putting them in a Python list and we are reversing it so that we get the most recent one first because what, what's left is timestamps. Timestamps are orderable. The longest or the larger the timestamp, the more recent the time it represents because they represent number of seconds since January the 1st, 1970. So by sorting this way, we'll get the most recently taken image first. The other thing that I wanted to point out was we are, whenever we, uh, Sorry, whenever we get some value that came back from Redis, so the key name in this case, I'm having to use Python's decode function on it. This is partly lazy coding on my part, but we want Redis Py, the client, to not interpret any of the data that comes back from Redis as anything specific. So we don't want it converting them to strings because one of our fields is going to be all of that image data, which is raw data. Um, so what I've done is when I've configured Redis Pi up here, I have not provided another parameter that you'll see in a lot of example code that says decode uh, responses equals true. And what that will do is decode everything that comes back from Redis into a string. We're not doing that. So everything that comes back from Redis is going to be byte arrays. So when I want a string, I have to decode it in Python. And string decoding is UTF-8. I'm just assuming all of my strings are UTF-8. Um, and I'm going to need to do that every time I want to handle one of these. What I could have done was created a separate connection to Redis and have one with the decode true and use that for all the values that aren't bytes and then had one with it false and use that for the image data. But that kind of complicates the example. Um, so just something to be aware of when you're mixing binary and string data in a single connection in Redis, the decoding is set at the connection level. So you're going to have to manage decoding your fields or use a separate connection to the same database and you know, use one for getting image bytes and one for getting strings. So that's that. That's going to get us all of the images. Then the other thing we want to do is get the metadata about each image. So the front end, when it's got all of the images, is it's going to start calling this route here with image IDs. And what that route's going to do is call this Redis command called hmget. That's going to be get multiple fields out of a hash. And we give it, again, we build the the key name, so the full key name never goes to the front end. It's kind of a secret. And we just use this image ID as part of that. But this prefix, front end never knows that. And then we're going to give it a list of fields that we want it to get back. And that's going to be all of the fields except for the image data. So it's going to be the timestamp and the, uh, what do we call it, mime, tam, mime type. And we can look at that command sort of in Redis here. So if I take one of these keys, and copy it and down here i run hm get and then paste the key name in and then we want field uh mime type and we want field time stamp and that's going to return us two things down there just the values of those and the redis pi client helps us out does what we'd expect and maps that to um a dictionary in Python. So yeah, we get the, the field names and the field values, and we can work with it like a normal dictionary. And then again, I'm just having to decode it to return it. So what this will return will be um, a dictionary of the metadata fields. Flask does as a favor here, and it will convert this to the appropriate JSON output. We don't have to do anything with that. Um, so those are like all of the data things, then to get the actual image data, we need something that um, works slightly differently. So 
what this root here is going to do is given an image ID timestamp, it's going to get just that image data field, so the binary one. And if we look at that, we're again using um, the HN get command. Okay, I lied. We're going to get the image data and we're also going to get the mime type. Um, and I need that so that when this returns something, the browser interprets what's being returned as an image file, not as text. So what will happen is it will render the actual image. It won't just blur out a load of binary data. So we got a quick check for if we actually found anything and we 404 if we didn't. So if you put in a trash image ID. And then what I do is I just load up the image data that comes back from Redis, which hasn't interpreted it or done anything with it. It's still raw, which is what we want, into the bytes IO uh, buffer that we used in the camera when we first captured it. And then I have to rewind that to the start. So there's a buffer pointer in that. So I just rewind the pointer to the start because um, we're now going to read from it. We don't want to append more data into it. And then um, Flask has a send file method. And what we're doing is sending that buffer back out. And then we're setting the mime type for it. So Flask will set the appropriate HTTP headers. Um, and we're saying, I want image data and uh, image data one, sorry, which is the mime type. And then I have to decode it back to a string. So image JPEG that comes out of Redis, the string will get decoded like that. And this here will go out as a binary file. So that's the entirety of our code for the front end. So the the thing to remember here is like the non-string data, we're again putting it into something that Python thinks is like a file in memory. And then Flask is able to send it out to the browser or whatever else requested it if we were building an API as that file without damaging it. And then we can pass on to the front end what data type is really in there. So image JPEG. Um, so that the front end can determine what to do with it. And for a browser, what it's going to do with it, if you put it in an image tag, is it's going to render it as an image, which is hopefully what we get to see. So that's kind of a long lead up to we can now start the server. Um, so over here, I've got the camera. It's not running at the minute. Over here, we've got the server. Uh, I just need to activate my virtual environment. So if you're working with Python, especially on a a multi-purpose machine like this laptop we're running on, um, use a virtual environment. So all of your dependencies, so the libraries you're using, so in this case, Flask and Redis Pi, get versioned per project, get installed locally and don't interfere with other projects. So once I've got that done, I can then start Flask like this, and it's gonna start here for us, localhost 5000. So let's take that and let's, display it here, and hopefully what we see is, yeah, lots of images of Daimon Kun. Um, so these all came out of Redis. So what happened when we hit this was we made a request to the get all of the images endpoint, and it returned us a list of just all of the uh, image IDs, so like these timestamps down here. And then we made two requests to Flask for each image. So that's like three, well, whatever the time complexity of that works out as, it's like one request to get all of the, uh, a list of what images there are, and then two additional requests per image. So don't do this with a large number of images because it you know, could do something more sensible. It could paginate and it could do lazy loading as needed. But as is, this, this will be fine for a small demo. So. What I was going to do was show how this uh, works. So if we bring up the inspector and we look at the network tab over here, then let's command R reload this. And what you'll see is it's loading lots and lots of things, including all of these things that it thinks are an image because we're serving them in the right way from Flask. Uh, but if we look at our sort of fetch calls, then we've got the first one here that gets all of the images, the response is just this JSON array of image IDs. That's a bit small, isn't it? There we go, that's maybe better. Um, so these are all the image IDs that are in Redis, so they're the timestamp parts of the key. 
And then if we look at each one of these, this is a metadata one. So it went and got the metadata about that, but it's displaying down here in a list. And let's see if we can see, uh... oh yeah, they're not fetch requests at that point. So um, the other sorts of requests we've got are image requests. So we make up a URL, so you can kind of see it in the highlight there maybe, slash API, slash image, slash the, um, the timestamp. And when you click on that, uh, what you'll see is in the response headers, the content type was set to image JPEG. Our Flask thing did that. It read the meta type out of Redis. And then what comes back is, um, you can't see it in here, but what you get is the image that gets interpreted correctly by the browser. So it's not been, um, it's not been misinterpreted or mangled. It's gone through Redis transparently. So Redis doesn't care about it. It hasn't encoded it or decoded it. We've handled all of that in the Python. So it's kind of on, on us to understand what's in that field. But the power of that is we can put pretty much anything in there and it's just going to work. So let's start the camera again. And uh, let's put something else in front of Domo Kun to prove that we're really doing this. So let's give him a shipping container. And I should probably have built a refresh into this. But so you get the idea. It was a few minutes ago. Uh, since we last captured one, now we're capturing again. If I refresh it, there we go. He's now got a shipping container in front of him. So um, we're capturing new images. And we are now kind of creating a runaway data problem here. So we've got images that are getting captured ad infinitum, and we're not dealing with them. So there's lots of ways we could deal with them. These could go into like a processing queue or something. And then we could put um, some logic in there that says, oh, OK, I've checked that image. It's not offensive or it meets our criteria for whatever. Put it on the Instagram feed via an API or whatever we're doing with it. Um, and it's important to note that I picked hashes to store the data in. But the point is, anything that expects a Redis string can take binary data. So if you wanted something that looks like a queue, then you could use a Redis list, and you can make a queue or a stack of these things and have folks process them or processes process them. If you wanted a thing that looks like um, a Redis stream, you can put this data in a Redis stream. Uh, you are not limited to what you put it in. You could put it in a JSON document if you wanted lots of other structure too. So. Don't think you have to use hashes with binary data. Anything that expects a Redis string, you're absolutely fine. So one last thing I wanted to show was one way that we can address this ongoing uh, issue of, hey, the database is getting bigger and bigger. Um, and what we can do is make some changes in the, uh, the camera code. So I am going to, rather than fire up the SSH connection in VS Code, I'm here at vicamera.py. Oops, sorry, it's not called camera. It's called capture.py. And what you'll see here is, let's begin this. Uh, what you see here is we've got this command hset, and what it's doing is storing the data in Redis. One of the things people use Redis for a lot is caching, which means you can set an expiry time on a key. So let's give our images a time to live. So let's do Redis client dot expire, Redis key, and let's make it like 20 seconds. And let's see if that does anything. So what happens now is we're capturing new images. And what we should do is let's add another object to the image. So anything with a red shipping container, <laughs> that's me placing the red shipping container. Anything with a red shipping container, come on, take another picture. There we go. When we go look in Redis Insight here, and I refresh the keys, what we should see is down here, look, some of these have got time to live and they're going to expire. The ones that don't were captured before we did this code change. 
So we're starting to manage our data set now by um, all of the ones with the, um, the red container will eventually disappear. This is the plan. If you give them long enough, they'll eventually go away. But it's also taking new pictures. So what we should really do is stop it taking new pictures at a faster rate than it's expiring the old ones. So what we should see now is here's some red shipping container pictures and Dymo gun. And one of them's gone. And the other one's hanging in there a bit. It's expiry period's not up yet. Still hanging in there, or maybe it's one that was, no, there we go, it's gone. So all of the ones with the red container are now gone. So we've used expire for that. Um, and then one final trick that I wanted to show was, um, we can make this a little bit more efficient. So if we go back into capture.py here, and we got two lines here that run Redis commands. So Redis lives on the network. Even if it's on your local machine, it's essentially a network uh, solution. So every command here is going to involve a network round trip to Redis to run the command and get the response. In this case, we can optimize this, this because we don't need the response from HSET to make a logic decision as to what to do next. We're always going to also send this expire command. So we can use a feature of the Redis protocol called pipelining and what that does is it lets us send multiple commands at the same time, but we don't get to see the responses until all of them are run. So that's okay in this, this case, we don't need to know what happened with HSET in order to do an expire. So what I'm gonna do is create a, a pipeline and you do that with Redis client dot pipeline. And there's a couple of ways this works in Redis and we don't actually want it to run transactionally. We don't need that and it takes a little bit of resource. So we'll turn that off. And then all I do is where I've got Redis client dot command here, I change that to pipe dot whatever the command is. And this is like queuing them up in a sort of buffer. So rather than doing two network round trips, whenever I do pipe dot execute, it's going to run whatever commands are in the pipeline at that point. And we're going to get all the responses back at once. And it's only going to do one network round trip. So it's a little bit more efficient. It's like 50% more efficient. Um, and that's a useful thing on low power devices like these Raspberry Pis or when we're on slow networks or just generally good behavior to keep your, your network overhead down. So if we do that, we hopefully won't see any real difference here other than it's Trust me, it's running faster, um, or it's making fewer network calls from the Pi to Redis. And then when we start with this again, we should see pictures with red containers. And it's hopefully taken a couple of those by now. And then when we turn it off so it doesn't keep adding new ones, we'll see that those pictures, those two are eventually going to expire because they have the time to live still set on them. There we go. We're down to one. And keep going. It's always a how often do you set the expiry to because like you need to be able to talk about it before it goes away but uh, there we go it's gone so we're back to only blue containers and no containers now which is the ones from before uh setting a a time to live on them and then only other thing i was going to show was well what if we didn't want to manage things like that we got other ways of managing it so i can pick one of these images that remains here so let's pick this one and I can, for example, edit it here in Redis Insight and give it a 10 second time to live. And it will then be gone after 10 seconds. Um, I can pick another one that currently doesn't have a time to live and I can copy its key name. And then down here in the CLI, I can use a command called expire, which is the same command we used in Python, and then the key name, and then 60. So the point here is I chose to set the expiry time in the camera code that's producing the images. And that's okay if we know that like, you know, this image doesn't have value after two minutes or something. 
But if I wanted something on a server to look at all of the images and then determine what the value or the lifespan of those is, we can just run that command on the server. As long as we know the key name, it's, it's absolutely fine. So you've got a lot of flexibility. Um, so yeah, that was sort of what I wanted to demonstrate. So a bit of fun with images. Yes, the camera is slightly out of focus. And yes, I will probably replace that with the version three camera with the focus. So. I will aim to come back with something that has that and then also use this metadata a little bit. So we can use something called the search capability in Redis stack, and we can build like a search index over these hashes. And we can say to it then, you know, find me everything that's a JPEG that was taken between this time and this time when the light conditions were about this many lux. And we can start to do some sort of searching for that. Um, if we got really clever, we could use um, the um, brain vector similarity search in, in search, and we could encode these images as embeddings. That's kind of not something I'm too familiar with at the minute, but need to learn about. And then we could ask it to find you know things where an image looks like another image, perhaps, or something like that. Um, so we'll be doing that. But uh, anyways, that is the image capture demo as it stands. I'm away from streaming for a couple of weeks, so I won't be able to do anything else with this in that time, but I will try to do it um, in the near future and come back. So again, here's the source code for that. I'm just gonna put this in the chat and with everything we do, uh, this is open source. So uh, feel free to steal my source code and feel free to get a free Redis instance um you can find that at don't have a banner for it but just go to redis.com slash try free and you can sign up for it there and actually all of that stuff's in the readme here i also put um separate readmes for each component so if you wanted to see for example how i had to configure the operating system here we go um operating system I was using and some config settings I had to put into the Raspberry Pi to get this to work with the camera library, then please use those because it might save a lot of trial and error uh, setup. These are specific to the Raspberry Pi camera module two, which is the older one. Uh, when I've got it working with the three, I'll come back and add a section for the, the version three. So yeah, that was uh that was everything for today. So hopefully you found that useful. And um, if you build something with it, please do share it with us. We have a Discord server. We would love to hear from you in there. Uh, and we do encourage people to like brag about their own product uh, projects. So if you've built something that uses Redis or an adjacent technology, or you're doing IoT stuff, then would love to hear from you in there. Um, I'll be back in, it's probably going to be a couple of weeks and change. So um, watch out for announcements on YouTube and Twitter. And we also have a developer relations schedule page here. So if you go there, you can see what we're up to. Um, yeah. Thanks very much, everybody. And um, I'll see you next time. Hopefully that's been useful. Bye.